the responses. We have had a tremendous response to this webinar. We had over 90 people that responded. So before we get started, I wanted to make sure that uh, we did a few housekeeping items. Please mute your phones and your video um, during the presentation. Um, because of the size, it may be important for us to uh, do that so that we can see everyone and have clearer connection, hear everyone, excuse me, and have clearer connections. The session is going to be recorded, so please know that. We're going to be using the chat box, which will be monitored by Anthony Bass. So as you're having questions during the presentation, please use the chat. And when we get to the question and answer presentation towards the later part of the session, we will be addressing all questions that have come in. So as we go through this agenda, um, we are going to at first hear from Akua Ellis, the Senior Vice President of Community Impact, and then move into Olivia Jess Jefferson, where we talk more deeply <laughs> about our community impact areas. Hear from our partners, Catherine Mears with Avenues for Homeless Youth and Valerie Stevenson with Phyllis Wheatley Community Center. We'll go through further detail of our response and recovery fund that Olivia Jefferson and Ann Soto will be discussing with you and then open it up for questions. Um, so without further ado, welcome Akua Ellis. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us and thank you for the invitation, uh, Leslie. One second here, grab control. Leslie, could you advance the slide for me? All right, uh, so it's important for me that we start this conversation with our theory of philanthropy because it guides all of our community impact efforts. Uh, when we talk about proven practices, we're speaking to those of our nonprofit partners. Our multi-year grant making is aligned on some long-term outcomes and through providing operating grants, we honor the multiple paths that are poss possible to reach uh, those long-term outcomes and goals. We recognize that there's lots of room to explore as a community, uh, ways to foster vitality, so we permit ourselves some space to innovate and test. And as an intermediary and longstanding community leader, we have the unique ability to bring varied stakeholders together to ensure the sum of our resources is greater than our separate efforts. What I'd like to underscore, given the topic of today's conversation, is that our overarching intent is to disrupt inequity, particularly as it relates to one's current income, race, or place. We call these factors out given where we know disparities in life outcomes are most persistent in our region and state. And COVID-19 promises to exacerbate existing disparities without intentional effort by all of us as direct service providers, donors, funders, and policymakers. Next slide here. So many of you have likely seen this graphic in the past. I share it here to illustrate the fullness of our approach to community support. You'll see how this all comes together. Uh, hopefully it'll make sense to you uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic in the coming slides. As you look at this picture in the center, you see an individual, a little person, a little square uh, stick figure in the middle there. While our immediate stakeholders in community impact are the nonprofit organizations that we fund, our approach is informed by the understanding that we are working in partnership with those organizations to ultimately serve individuals and families people who don't navigate poverty in silos, hence the concentric circles of our impact areas. And more specifically, we see our role as partnering with nonprofit organizations on the needs identified on the left toward those longer term outcomes outlined on the right in service to that person in the middle. For greater, I'll go back. Go back, please. Let's see. Will you go back to the previous slide, Leslie? There we go. 
Uh, for the Greater Twin Cities United Way, household stability, meaning having a place to call home that is safe and affordable with access to basic needs like healthy food is foundational to a person's ability to thrive. With that sound foundation, it's a lot easier to create an environment conducive to learning. And you're more likely to get and keep a job if you've got an address to put on your application and place to lay your head to rest before clocking in. And let's just be real. The challenges that we seek to address are in many ways manifestations of unjust systems. Across the bottom of this page, you see capacity building, impact measurement, systems change, in addition to grant making. These are all the levers we can pull in addition to grant making to actualize all this theory. Now you're probably sitting at your computer thinking, okay, that's fine, but what does any of this have to do with COVID-19? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> What I want to share next is what our response has been to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and get the next slide here. The 211 resource helpline that we uh, administer as part of Greater Twin Cities United Way is a confidential information and uh, information referral service that operates 24 7 365 and we provide the service to roughly 90% of the state's population. When we first went to shelter in place as a state, we saw call volumes spike tremendously to three times what they had previously been for the same period last year. We've now found a new normal for whatever that's worth uh, in these times, but see volumes at double what they were this time last year. 211 serves as an objective real time ticker tape of need. We are working with school districts and policymakers across the state to support their own emergency responses. As you can see, the most commonly requested support is related to housing and food. This information, coupled with what we're hearing from our nonprofit partners, is actively informing our advocacy. I mentioned housing as a primary concern for callers to 211. Information related to rental assistance is far and above the biggest request. We are advocating for an emergency state investment into the Family Homelessness Prevention Assistance Program. In fact, we provided testimony yesterday at both the House and Senate, uh, and you can check out the action alert that is on our website, and I invite you to share that broadly with your constituents. All of this provides financial support to people, or the Family Homelessness Prevention Assistance Program provides financial support for people at imminent risk of homelessness, along with the creation of a nonprofit recovery fund as part of our advocacy work. Because we know that some of the lingering effects of this pandemic are yet unknown, and the health of the nonprofit sector will no doubt impact our state's ability to fully recover. We're working to be responsive with webinar content, such as today's. We had a, a session where Dr. Joy uh, a couple of weeks ago to, to find calm in the midst of chaos. And all of this um, is in response to what we're hearing as needs um, and information requested from our nonprofit partners. We're also curating online content to provide a one stop shop for our nonprofit partners uh, for relevant information and resources. And then there's the COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund invested in alignment with what you've heard from what we've heard from our nonprofit partners and the approach that I walked you through just a few moments ago. The thing that has struck me about this pandemic is that it is impacting everyone. Olivia will go into more detail regarding the fund, but I want to note here that this, uh, what has been in already two waves of grants uh, released within three weeks of the fund's creation. And this has meant a tremendous team effort for my team who are at the end of the day, people still trying to figure out what this all means for them personally and for their families. So I wanna take a moment to acknowledge their effort and say thank you. And we have dollars to disperse because of hundreds of generous donors. So thank you to anyone who's on this call that has contributed to our efforts. Your dollars provide rocket fuel to an amazing cast of team members. Thank you so much, Akua, um, for that overall strategy and what we're working on. Next, I'm going to introduce Olivia Jefferson, who is our Director of Equity and Holistic Grant Making here at Greater Twin Cities United Way. Um, Olivia? Thank you, Leslie. 
Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, in addition to leading our internal equity work and our holistic grant making team, I have had the honor of serving on a core team that has designed our response strategy for the Response and Reco Recovery Fund. Um, I also wanted to just um, make sure that you all know that my counterpart and one of the co-leads of that group, Ann Soto, who is the Community Impact Innovation Director, is also on this call and will be available to help answer questions when we get to that segment of our time together. So, you know, we know that there is no doubt that this crisis will have long-term impacts on our community, the nonprofit sector, and the economy. Um, as a result, we have developed a phased funding strategy that will address immediate needs related to the COVID-19 pandemic with the potential to evolve as funds are available um, to address stabilization and recovery. We heard from our Council of Agency Executive Advisory Group, um, five of our nonprofit leaders that we convened to consult with us on strategy. They expressed that their needs are evolving um, and shift by the week needs are immediate and that once the shelter in place lifts, there will be a host of new and unanticipated needs. We also heard an affirmation of what we're very aware of, which is that we don't know the timeline and depth that this impact is having and will have on our community. In the immediate emergency relief phase, we've now dispersed two rounds of funding and just closed the application on our website for a third round yesterday. The process that we used for each round to date has been to listen and synthesize the most pressing needs as lifted up by our nonprofit partners, determine grantees and distribute funding aligned with our equity value and our organizational principles, and regroup and assess. Um, next slide, please. We are committed to aligning our work with the realities and needs on the ground. Um, our community impact team continues to be in conversation with our nonprofit partners to understand the fast evolving COVID related needs and challenges. And so overall, what we've heard to date is that strains on mobile delivery programs actually had impacts on multiple organizations pivoting to meet the needs of their participants. And this was not just solely for food providers. Um, shelters are under serious strain, grappling with the reality of supporting segmented shelter for seniors individuals, families with COVID symptoms, and those who need to quarantine or self-isolate all in one space together. Early education programs are doing all they can and need immediate support to continue serving families during this crisis, especially those impacted by halts or cutbacks to their programming. Many programs are expanding to serve children of all ages, especially for our essential workers. Um, and there are two notes I want to make sure I call out about the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Black, Indigenous, and people of color from low wealth households. The first is about trends, and the second relates to what we've heard directly from our nonprofit partners. So as it relates to the trends that we're tracking, um, what we've been really learning is that, you know, it's been determined that COVID-19 will have an outsized impact on um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, this is true for both the mortality rate and economic effects of the coronavirus. This reflects what has historically been the case in other natural disasters for people of color. Um, in our region, um, BIPOC individuals are more likely to reside in densely populated areas that could increase transmission of the virus. Um, they are more likely to be unemployed and therefore may also lack health insurance to pay for the immediate medical care that could actually keep cases from becoming fatal. Um, we are also seeing that Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities are more likely to work in jobs where remote work just is not possible. Um, and from our nonprofits, what we've heard is that organizations are transitioning to offer face-to-face -face programs and services online and by phone where possible, as well as making several other shifts to minimize the disruption of their connection with their participants. Um, we've heard that from um, BIPOC-led and also white-led organizations. However, um, BIPOC-led organizations have been historically undercapitalized, um, even though studies continue to show that there are deeper positive outcomes for people assessing culturally specific services. And so finally, unemployment is at a record high. This is disproportionately impacting low-wage jobs and sectors. 
Um, nonprofits are seeing huge demands for help with unemployment, application filings, and requests for direct cash assistance to pay for things like rent and utility bills. Um, and I just want to also note before I conclude here is that this is not an exhaustive list by any means. And Anne and I would be happy to talk in more detail about the needs that we are hearing, um, even as um, late as just two weeks ago during the question and answer period. Um, next slide, please. And so to respond to the many needs we heard, we acted quickly with emergency funds. Um, the first round of funds equal to 2000 I'm sorry, $200,000 when was released on March 23rd to 32 food security and housing organizations currently providing emergency shelter. We prioritize these organizations given the immediate need for increased emergency food capacity and the health and safety within our local shelters. Grant sizes were dependent on funds and the number of grantees within those portfolios. Um, grant amounts were determined, um, taken into consideration the following. So organizations serving a high percentage of older adults, organizations serving a high percentages of black, indigenous, and people of color, organizations serving a large percentage of those living at or below 100% of the federal poverty line, and organizations with budgets under $3 million. Um, we wanted to put a finer point on organizations that were small or medium sized because we know that those organizations are likely to have challenges with cash flow, um, particularly when um, things like this hit. And also we know that they don't often have advancement capabilities um, beyond uh, their usual fundraising cycles. And so we released the second round of funding on April 8th, equaling to $315,000 to 56 of our grantees. Um, our response for the second round was focused on early childhood nonprofits that seek to stay open, reopen to serve existing and new families, including children of essential workers, and or pivot to continue to providing services to meet the immediate basic needs of families with young children. Um, we also focused on organizations led by and serving Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities as they are uniquely positioned to respond to their communities in a time of crisis, requiring um, resources to ensure minimal disruption of services. Um, and finally, we supported efforts to offer direct relief funds and benefits assistance for individuals and their families being hardest hit by COVID-19 layoffs with a specific emphasis on laid off union and non-union workers within the especially hard hit hospitality sector, um, which is disproportionate to low wage and low benefit jobs. In addition, research does indicate that hospitality and event workers are disproportionately female and immigrants and people of color. And as with the first round, all funding was distributed directly to our grantees and labor partners. Um, the range of grants were between five and ten thousand dollars, and as we considered funding amounts, we did factor in those most likely to be disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, um, small and medium-sized nonprofits. Um, and in both rounds, we wanted organizations to focus on their work, and so we made sure that we were not asking for immediate reporting at this time. Um, funds in both rounds were also deployed to nonprofits diligently reviewed in our regular grant making activities, which allowed us to put um, dollars to work quickly. And so um, if you can move to the next slide, um, we are just really excited for you all to hear from two of our funding recipients and our current grantees. Um, they will discuss the impact of COVID-19 on their organizations and how the response and recovery funds have supported their work. Um, first, I would like to introduce you to Catherine Merce, Executive Director with Avenues for Homeless Youth. Um, Catherine um, joined Avenues for Youth as Executive Director in 2017. Um, she has a doctorate degree and has been involved in youth work for more than 20 years, working in adolescent sexual and reproductive health and in education disparities reduction. Um, we are also very excited to have Valerie Stevens, Interim Executive Director with Phyllis Wheatley Community Center, join us for our panel discussion today. Valerie Stevens is the Director of Programs and is currently serving as part of an interim ED leadership team with two other key staff. Valerie has been at Phyllis Wheatley Community Center since 2001 and, more than and has more than 35 years of experience establishing collaborative and community services that will empower children and families. 
The determination and commitment demonstrated by the children and families motivates Valerie to continue developing new and positive community collaboratives that will ensure the successful outcomes for students and families. Valerie is a former longtime resident of North Minneapolis, and as a teenager, Valerie attended Phyllis Wheatley's Community Center for Enrichment and, Re um, and Recreation Activities. This inspired Valerie to seek a profession that would allow her to help children and families. So um, first, I, if Valerie, if you don't mind, um, I would love for you to just address our first question, which is tell us how COVID-19 has impacted you, your organization, staff, and of course, the people that you serve. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Carrie, and thank you, United Way, for inviting me to this event. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how uh, it's impacted uh, Phyllis Wheatley Community Center. Phyllis Wheatley, the, we are, we've always been historically an agency that is a face-to-face -face agency where we meet people at their needs and we draw on seeing our clients um, in one-on-ones, up close and personal. Um, we we serve a community that is impoverished and who don't have a lot of trust with people. So we were always our key is meeting people where they are. So we'll come to them. And that is how we built our trust with families because of COVID-19. This has really impacted some trust issues families are having. They're worried they're scared, they're concerned. Um, and we, by our face-to-face -face contact, we were always able to ensure and support families that we could help them through situations. But with this COVID-19, it has, because of the distance, families are scared and we are relying on our phone communication with our families to ensure them, to empower them, to uh, talk them through situations where they're scared. Um, some are even angry because this is impacting them so much um, based on the fact that they don't have the finances to be able to buy food by necessities. So we have become a resource to connecting them to different um, connections that will enable them to have just food, their basic needs for their children. This has also impacted families because a lot of them the families that we serve uh, are court, they're court mandated for different programs that we we have. And this relied on them attending groups at the building um, for some weekly for three hours, and they have not been able to do that. And for some of them just attending those groups and seeing their facilitator face to face, they got empowered, they got supported, and they're not able to do that. But we want to still ensure that they meet their court recommendations. So we have turned to doing emails, doing Zoom calls, doing phone calls, mailing out packets. Um, and this has been all of our programs across the board, our truancy programs. We've also been doing this with our early child care center parents as well. We have temporarily closed our classrooms due to COVID, but this funding that we received from United Way will help us to buy necessary supplies we need, masks, gloves. Um, it would enable us to be able to reorganize our room a little bit so we can pivot and reopen back up to serve families. Some of those children in the child care centers has special needs issues and they relied on that 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 physical touch and that communication from the child care staff um, to be able to just get through the day. And now they don't have that. And we do have a lot of parents that are struggling. They're single parents. They have more than one child. So even with children who they have that are special needs, they're having to try to focus on working with that child as well as meeting the needs of their other kids. And then there's a we have a truancy program where the biggest piece of that program was seeing our children at school and, and encouraging them and, and motivating them. And we're not able to do that. And now they're scared and, and they want to know 
why someone who has been visiting them on a weekly basis can no longer come and see them anymore and encourage them to be at school, to be engaged, to understand the importance of an education. So we're having to do this over the phone, but we struggle with some parents who have pay-as-you-go phones. We have some parents who have state-provided free cell phones, so they're limited minutes. So we've we've had to, with this funding, we've had to, we bought uh, our staff cell phones so they can make sure they're, they're communicating with our families. We've also had to, we've, our, our cost of our printing materials, because we come in and we print out materials that we send out, the cost of our printing has went up, as well as our mailing. We're mailing out a lot of information to parents. So the cost of mailing went up. So that this, this additional funding will support some of those things, um, as well as continue to pay our staff, our childcare staff until we reopen. We have good quality staff that have been at Phyllis Wheatley for 14, 15 plus years. So we don't wanna lose those staff. They're very rooted in the community. They're very connected to those parents. Those parents truly rely on those staff. That is some of the reason that the parent has kept children there for so many years. And Phyllis Willie is a generational organization. So we have families that have been, have been coming for generations and generations and generations. It's also an organization where it's one person recommends it to another person in the community. And that's how we've been able to recruit for childcare. That's how we've been able to keep our other programs full because Families, because we are word of mouth, we're generational. Families know based on just a response from a past family member that they know they can come there and get the support and the help they need. So this COVID situation and this COVID pandemic has really caused a caused a disconnect for us for some of for some of our families. And we we rely on face to face. The families rely on that from us, and they're not able to get that from us. So they really struggle with that now. We struggle with that because we're worried, we're concerned that this is going to, at the end of this, cause even more damage to families. It, it And families that we've worked with through our domestic abuse program, how them attending our, our their weekly meetings at the center and able to talk to the facilitator, to talk them through situations of domestic abuse now they are scared and don't know if they should go back to the person who was abusing them just as a sense of security. So this all the way around has affected not just, it's affected families, it's affected organizations, it's affected staff, because you have people that are concerned in terms of how will families get through with this? What more can we do? Are we doing enough? That is what we struggle with every single day. Thank you so much for providing so much insight um, and just helping us really understand the plight of what you are dealing with um, and hearing every day from the folks that you serve. I just want to say thank you for that. Um, so Catherine, um, would love for you to also address that same question and just tell us how COVID-19 has impacted you, your organization, staff, and the people you serve. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you, everyone, for, um, for participating today. Thank you to United Way for pulling this together. Um, so at Avenues for Youth, we, uh, we partner with youth who are experiencing homelessness to achieve their dreams. And COVID-19 is definitely impacting um, what those partnerships look like. It's impacting uh, the youth that we support. It's definitely impacting our staff. I think that you know one of the biggest impacts, of course, is that the, our youth and our staff are anxious and scared um, uh, and, and really under a lot of stress right now. Um, young folks who are isolated to begin with because they are Business, asking them to uh, then self-isolate and stay at home can really increase um, mental health challenges. Happily, we've been able to increase our mental health therapist hours with us, and she's available to staff and youth both. And I think the Avenue staff are doing an amazing job of modeling for young people um, 
being calm and, and carrying on. Um, at the same time, we've had to reduce our capacity somewhat. Uh, we have shared bedrooms in our shelter in North Minneapolis. And so we've had to reduce capacity at that shelter in order to have appropriate uh, social distancing space within the bedrooms. And also in order to be able to have some space uh, for quarantine if we do have young folks who are experiencing symptoms or have tested positive uh, for, for COVID-19. At the same time, we're seeing an increased need. Um, so to the extent that family conflict is a uh, contributing factor in youth homelessness, um, the stay-at-home order, uh, families that are already experiencing some conflict, that may be exacerbating that. I also think the long-term impact, uh, we have the moratorium on evictions right now, but when that moratorium is lifted, we were already in an affordable housing crisis, and I think we're going to see a huge wave of folks being evicted. And it's certainly the case at Avenues that we have young people with us all the time who are absolutely loved and cherished by their families and their whole family is experiencing homelessness and they have um, had to split up in order to find housing. So um, I think we're seeing some increased need now and we're gonna see a whole lot more in the months to come. Uh, our youth are um, adapting, I think, to online learning. We have a number of young folks uh, with us right now who are in high school. Um, and they are adapting to, to online learning and we are adapting to make sure that we have the technology that they need to be able to participate in online learning. Uh, most of the youth that are currently in our programs who were employed have been laid off. So we're doing a lot of work to help them um, apply for unemployment um, and um, access the individual supports that are available to folks. Uh, we're also having to find creative ways to support uh, folks in our community-based programs. We have a host home program, the, our Connect host home program, where youth uh, uh, live with hosts in the community who have opened up their home to them. And we also have a rapid rehousing program for young families, so youth-headed households. Um, uh, with children and that's a scattered site. So they're in apartments around the metro area. Um, and both of those programs, like um, like Valerie was talking about with um, at Phyllis Wheatley, those are programs that are typically very in-person intensive. So the staff of those programs are meeting frequently with youth and hosts, providing um, opportunities for hosts to meet together, meeting frequently with the young families, bringing the young families together for um, educational opportunities and support group opportunities, and none of that can happen right now. So trying as best we can to do that by phone and online um, is, is um, but you know, it's not the same and, it, and it's, it's definitely hard on youth and it's hard on staff um, not to be able to be together um, in those programs. Uh, and then, of course, we're seeing increased costs at the same time that we are um, postponing um, some spring fundraisers. So um, the United Way funding is super helpful at this time. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I think sometimes we we forget about the intimacy and just how important that is in building relationships. Um, particularly when you are trying to um, offer services um, and and move people along, I think that is just something that I know even even now I am craving <laughs> uh, personal intimacy. Um, and so, um, if you don't mind, Catherine, since you were just talking, if you could just let us know how um, the additional funding has helped your organization during these challenging times. I know you were mentioning just a little bit there, so just wondering if you wouldn't mind expanding or expounding upon that. Yeah, absolutely. I think the um, the thing that has been so impactful about the United Way funding for us is its flexibility. Um, there have been, there are funding sources available to folks supporting people experiencing homelessness from the state um, and from some other funders. And that funding is great. And it's also more narrowly targeted to specific costs, cost increases related to COVID-19. So staffing costs, um, food costs, and certainly we're experiencing increased costs there. 
the United Way funding with the flexibility, uh, we've been focusing a lot of that on helping to prepare us for quarantining youth within our shelters. Um, uh, so, a, or quarantining a young person in a host home or quarantining a young person in their apartment if they're in the Young Families Program. So making sure that everyone has the technological capability to continue communicating if, a, you know, if, um, if somebody needs to be quarantined. Um, figuring out ways to, um, to make our shared bedrooms, uh, you know, like putting up, being able to put up screens or hang sheets around beds or, you know, all of that takes some money or some technology or some, you know, some structures that, that don't fall easily into um, some of the more narrowly defined um, funding streams. So uh, the flexibility has, is really helping us prepare for if we need to quarantine any of our young folks. Thank you so much. And um, Valerie, I know you also touched on this a little bit um, earlier in your comments and just wondering if there was anything else that you'd like to add just about how um, the additional funding has helped your organization. Absolutely. Um, I will definitely piggyback off of what Catherine said. Just the flexibility of the money has also allowed us to um, continue to pay our child care staff. It's also helped us with some technology capability because we wanted to make sure that all of the staff had access to Zoom and Microsoft Teams. They had working laptops, cell phones, um, as well as making sure that we had, this will also help us to pay um, for extra staff if we need to bring in temporary staff to help with our reopening back up our classrooms when we need to deep clean every day. Um, so this funding will help support that as well as just like I said, it has helped us with our postage and because we're sending out so many mailings per day, um, it's it's helped with that increased cost. It's helped with our printing costs because we send mailings out to all of our parents, child care, our child care parents, our truancy attendant, our parents for our truancy program, our men's and women's program. So we're sending out information daily. So it's it's helped to support those those costs, but it's really helped to support us pivoting to reopen back up our child care center because we will have to restructure our rooms in order for us to accommodate uh, essential worker families. So uh, we, we're grateful that it was sent to, and it was sent in the form of that we could use it for what we needed to use it for for being flexible. So we we definitely appreciate that because it's it it's really helped us. It's helped us with even more cleaning supplies because we come to the building sometime too. So we we have had to increase the cost of paying our maintenance staff, our janitorial staff, because they do deep cleans. So it, it that's that's additional cost for us as well. Thank you um, to you both. Um, I have a, a little bit of time and I would love it if um, both of you could also just speak to one more question um, that we've been sort of um, pondering and just curious about your thoughts. Um, while we don't know when this crisis will end, um, could you both just tell us a little bit about how you all as executive directors are thinking about the road to recovery? And so Valerie, um, if you don't mind, would you like to take that question? Well, that's one thing. I'm part of a leadership team, and that's the one thing we do it daily is we talk about what is this going to look like on the back end? How will we, is this our new normal? Is this how we will be serving families? What we've been doing is talking about what we we need to start looking at data and gathering information in terms of moving forward, how we can work better with our our contracts, how we can work better with our partners to see if we can yet keep some of the things that we're doing right now, that if, if we gradually open back up to um, bringing people to the building, how do we look at, do we expand having more groups and we have less people in those groups and we have them wear masks 
we're looking at different things like that and we're breaking kind of each program down to see if this becomes a norm a new normal for us how do we effectively make sure that we continue to do what we're doing because what we don't want to do is we don't want to lose any of the families that we have and we want to make sure that we are in a capacity to be able to help more families um, as this continues we 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 don't want to limit what we have and just say okay we have these particular families we're working we're just going to stay with these we want to be able to help more families so we have been kind of strategizing as to how we're going to do that once this i don't even want to say ends because at this point i don't see this ending soon but we want to make sure that we are able to continue to serve the families of our community um, and the children of our community so we've looked at what do we do and how do we do it in order to make it so families continue to receive the services that they're receiving that we meet um, court orders um, court requirements for families that families still can have child care that we still can make sure that children are learning that we're supporting families with um, children in school so right now we're just kind of sitting down breaking down each program looking at just some of the data we have as to how we work with families in the past and how can we incorporate how we work with them um, in the past versus how we will work with them moving forward so that's kind of what we've been doing no i really appreciate that um i wasn't expecting a full-blown <laughs> answer so i just i'm just thankful oh, that. sorry no, 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 no. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that I know that it's really difficult to sort of come up with an actual plan right now because we're still in crisis mode. So um, I'm just thankful for what you were able to provide and just letting us just kind of have a peek in your in the window of what you all are thinking about. So thank you so much, Valerie. I really appreciate it. Um, and, and same to you, Catherine, um, as you're thinking about sort of the road to recovery, what's been top of mind for you? Yeah, um, so I think top of mind, we're just, we're starting now to do scenario planning um, and we're a July 1 to June 30 uh, fiscal year. So we're trying to, you know, look into our crystal balls and figure out what next year will bring. I think the, the big question for us is we see a huge need coming and we have concerns about um, being able to meet that need. Um, you know, on any given night in Minnesota, there are 6,000 young people who are experiencing homelessness and we have shelter beds for about 15% of them. So there's already a huge unmet need. I think it's going to get worse. And the question really is, um, if as we're if we're heading into a significant recession, um, how, how are we going to be able to sustain financially as an organization to, to meet that need? Um, I think we're also learning a lot about um, our space and how the ways in which our physical shelters are and aren't prepared for um, being able to uh, isolate or quarantine young people who are ill. Um, and we're definitely looking at what we can do um, in the future to keep, to keep our capacity up and at the same time be able to um, be able to separate out young people when they're when they're ill. So those are kind of the two two things that are top of mind for us right now. Thank you so much to you both. Um, one of the things that I just really wanted to lift up is just how incredibly, um, flexible that you all are having to be. So I appreciate you talking about our flexible funding, but what I'm also hearing is just that you all are being incredibly agile and um, in this environment. And so just want to thank you um, and wrap up this panel segment by expressing our sincere gratitude to you both for sharing your perspectives, um, speaking your truth and also holding um, your communities in your hands. Um, we are so grateful for all that you do to strengthen our community. And I hope you um, both will stick around to participate in our question and answer segment. So thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, I will move into my last section of the presentation with an overview of our most recent grant opportunity. Um, in addition to rounds one and two that I mentioned prior, um, we also released a funding opportunity um, through application for a two week period to support organizations and partnerships. Um, we very deliberately opened this opportunity to both current grantees and non-funded grantees. Um, we were able to move quickly in the first and second rounds by leveraging the diligence that we had already completed on our current funded nonprofits. Um, however, we know that this need is great and wanted an opportunity to support those outside of our current partners. Um, those organizations that were funded in round one and two are all, were also eligible to apply. And so the focus for um, that application was really around three things. Um, organizations that have expanded the reach of existing services to support people's immediate needs during the pandemic, organizations that have pivoted or changed or started new services to support people's immediate needs, um, during this pandemic, and finally, partnerships that are working in collaboration to expand their reach into community to support more um, people's immediate needs during the pandemic. Um, this focus is open to allow for a diversity of different organizational responses and approaches, but also specific to what we heard from nonprofits as the biggest general need. Um, we are offering a minimum of 400,000 that will be dispersed as part of this funding round. And of course, more resources may be added to the round just based on our fundraising. Um, similar to what we um, heard from peer funders, um, we do expect that the need um, versus the demand to far outweigh what we're able to provide. Um, so for example, um, we heard a peer funder share just a couple of weeks ago that they saw seven times more applications than what they were actually able to fund. Um, but still, we anticipate that this next round of funding will be dispersed before the end of May. Um, and to date, um, as of this morning, um, we received 188 eligible applications. And so while we are definitely excited for the opportunity to, to provide support to our nonprofits, um, this is still an example of just how great the need is in our community um, and just don't want to forget that. So um, as I conclude my section, I just really want to thank you all for your time. And now I'm going to hand it over to Leslie to open us up for questions. Thanks so much, Olivia. And <clears throat> excuse me, Valerie and Catherine, um, your input that influences our work is commendable and we couldn't do this without the feedback that you have as we grow in this very, very uncertain time. Now we're going to get to the question and answer area. And Anthony Bass is going to um, recite the questions as well as who should be answering those questions. Um, so Anthony, take it away. Sure, we've had a question uh, in the chat that's been kind of circulating and I'll just put it out there once again for if not our panelists, then maybe Olivia or Ann. Um, the question was how how agencies are allocating hazard pay for staff, if any. Olivia or Ann? Could you repeat the question one more time, Anthony? The question is uh, how are agencies allocating hazard pay for their staff? Hmm. And was that the word hazard, H-A-Z-A-R-D? That is correct. Hmm, interesting. Um, I'm going to actually, um, Akua, do you, have you heard of hazard pay? That's a new one for me. Yes, there's actually a really <laughs> a healthy discussion happening in the chat related to hazard pay. Ah, okay, I should read yeah, that. <laughs> so there are a number of nonprofit um, leaders who have chimed in about their approach. Um, and then Dan Rodriguez shared uh, a series of links to additional guidance. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. If there are any other questions, you can add them to the, the chat box. <clears throat> or if you don't want to add them to the ch chat box, just because we are um, ahead of schedule, we wanted to ensure that we had as much um, feedback from you all as possible. So if anyone would like to unmute themselves and ask a question, that would be certainly fine. Um, and if not, we'll just pause and wait for some more questions. 
or ask for some last remarks from any of our panelists and Akua or Olivia. There are no questions in the chat box at this time. Here we go. Um, next question, has anybody received PPP funding and how are you tracking that? A question for uh, you, Olivia. Or um, anyone. Yeah, I would actually, I want the um, our nonprofits to, to pipe up first and then we can respond. Sure. Ellie responded, uh, Touchstone Mental Health received PPP. Any other agency partners know of anyone who received um, the PPP? Okay, here we go. Um, also, another response, Avenue is offering hazard pay to direct service staff. Um, she want to say it's, excuse me, it's set amount and currently tied to the governor's stay at home order ending. Um, but they're also hoping to raise additional uh, dollars to continue to offer through at least early June. I got another question uh, from Kathy. Uh, the question is any special or new ideas to care for staff who are working remotely? That could be for the panelists or um, Anne, Olivia. What was the question again? I'm sorry, Anthony. Once again, it's uh, any special or new ideas to care for staff who are working remotely? Yes. Yeah, so um, here at United Way, I actually, when we first went remote, did some um, initial like research online, trying to figure out like ways to be able to support your team um, during a time like this, um, especially when you have to go fully remote. And that's not necessarily um, you, we have the policies in place so people can do remote, but not at this scale. Um, and I actually found several great articles on this. And um, just a couple of weeks ago, sent my team some little, uh, just small little care packages just to let them know that I was thinking about them during this hard time. Because as we know, our staff are also juggling many things. Some of them have become full-time teachers, in addition to daycare providers, um, in addition to being partners and also um, taking care of um, other family members as well. And so how do we just continue to lift each other up? And I, I can also um, throw the link that I found in the chat box in case other people are interested in just thinking about other out of the box ways of supporting their teams and staff. It looks like most of these questions are just general questions for all the agency leaders who are in attendance, not necessarily a United Way question. So I'll just put it out there. And if you feel like you want to respond, you can unmute yourself and respond. Uh, so here's a question from um, a particular leader that says, this might be a strange thought, but are organizations adding additional employee benefits at this time? And you don't necessarily have to respond through the chat. You can actually unmute yourself to respond. It was an addition to that question, such as life insurance. Anthony, so I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that a little bit. We 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 didn't we just wanted to make sure that everyone had health care. That was sure. something that we were. We insisted on making sure that everyone had health care. That was one of and we didn't add anything. Most of our most of our uh, staff did, but um, 
that had health care through the agency, some didn't. But for those who didn't, we wanted to make sure they had some type of health care. So we kind of sat down with everybody just to ensure that they did. Awesome. Anyone else? Any other comments? And please don't don't feel like you have to um, put in the chat. You can unmute yourself and, and share. Okay, there seems to be no other questions. Outstanding. One of the things, um, Anthony, and thank you so much for that, and thank you everyone for your questions. As we do have a little bit of time remaining, I'd like to open it up for any of our nonprofit partners to talk freely about some of the impact that COVID-19 has had on them or their organizations. I think one of our greatest learnings is listening to each other and one hearing that we're not alone. So if anyone would like to share what the impact of COVID-19 has had on their organization with the greater community, that would be great. Just unmute yourselves and feel free to talk. Hi, Leslie, it's Kathy Mays, how are you? Wonderful. How are you, Kathy? Hi, Leslie. It's Kathy Mays. Can you hear me? I can. I can. Nice to see you. Um, you know, I just wanted to share with the group. I know that people um, in in the um, in the safety net and, and more food are seeing triple the amount of folks coming through, and it is really um, wow. It, it's it's tough to um, tough to ask for help. And you know, we used to serve about 3,500 meals a day and we're toppling over 10,000. So um, it's, it's really a, a, it's a hard time and it's a good time. And I posted a really great article that somebody sent to me today. So um, I just wanted to share that it's an article about, about all the great work that the leaders in this chat room are doing. So blessings to all of you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Anyone else we'd love to hear? Hi, Leslie, can you hear me? I can. Hi, Leslie, it's Amel from Somali Success. Um, because we have a large population of adult basic education um, and English language learners, we had to shut down um, we actually shut down one week ahead of the school shutdowns. And the biggest surprise for us was the explosion in phone calls for support services. Because the clients are doing long distance uh, learning now, we have gone up 380% in phone calls, and most of them are COVID related. Um, basically, telling people the right information and what they can get connection and resources to. Uh, that's been a new job on top of everybody. So that's something that we just shared. Our staff is only 11 people, but we created navigators. And each one of us is a navigator to about 40, 50 families. And basically they call and we try to guide them through information. There's so much misinformation in people who don't speak the language and um, bad information circulating. So that's the main thing that I noticed. I'm sorry, I think we may have lost them all. Um, Oh, she's oh, I'm here. I just, I think oh, okay. I just stopped talking. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Makisha from Model Cities. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. So while this has been really, uh, you know, hard and tough and overwhelming time, what I can say here at Model Cities 
we have um, really experienced the resilience of our community and people stepping up. So we have countless and countless um, stories of people in our organization stepping up. We have a lot of um, supportive housing. We have um, our uh, emergency shelter. And what I can say is people have stayed later to make sure that um, our facilities are cleaned. We have resident managers that have literally gone every day to Menards to pick up toilet paper to make sure everybody in our housing units um, have toilet paper and haven't asked for a dime of the, the money back. Actually didn't tell us that that's what they were doing. Um, we, have had, um, we have had to ask our case managers to go remote um, and the leadership team is actually um, the essential workers. And so we've been checking on families on top of our other duties. Um, you know, we have made sure that our kids are fine in the housing units. Um, what I've seen is people have really just stepped up and are, are making sure our families are taken care of. Um, we actually have um, joined forces with PPL's security um, and now are providing security. So at the beginning of this, we were finding a lot of domestic violence happening in our units. And so we instantly try to get security in. And so now we're doing a joint collaborative between PPL security and ours um, to make sure that we can provide safety for our families. So what I'm actually seeing is things are, are, are stepping up around here um, and, and we're making sure that our families are being cared for and taking care of one another, whether it's people are coming out of their own pockets um, to do so. So that's what we're seeing around here. Thank Thanks you. so much. Any other comments? Well, hearing move on and conclude a, a little bit early. It's nothing like the gift of time to give back to people. But with gratitude, gratitude turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos into order, confusion into clarity. It makes sense of our past, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for tomorrow. And that's a quote by Melody Beatty. Lastly, We'd love for you to get involved as much as you can in between making a gift, volunteering, not only in other organizations in the community, and just join with us in anything that we do, and we will join in anything that you will do. And most importantly, lately we have been really relying on our nonprofit partners to advocate with us, and you've shown up greatly. We'll continue to give this information in our newsletters, which come out every two weeks, so that you could see the additional resources that we have, the additional information on the COVID fund, as well as our advocacy efforts and 211. We will be communicating this presentation, not only in the newsletter, but on our website for you to access. And we'll also love your feedback, just in case we need to make improvements for the future, as well as give any additional information that you feel that we should have. We thank you again for joining us today. And if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of the other presenters on the panel. Lastly, I wanna make sure that I thank the United Way team of Akua Ellis, Olivia Jefferson, Ann Soto, and all of the directors that had in, and staff that had anything to do with this, specifically Anthony Bass, who facilitated our conversations and questions, and the presentation. Most importantly, thank you to Valerie Stevenson from Phyllis Wheatley and Catherine Mears with Avenues for Homeless Youth. This was great and we couldn't have done it without you. 
So without further ado, I am graciously handing you back 24 minutes in your day, and please have a good day and stay safe.